Bad news, guys. Beer. It's going to get really expensive. Why? Water. We need water. We need predictable sources of water. Um, media is doing a fantastic job of covering what is happening to the world. Um, our climate, our crops, our food sources, um, the very tangible and real parts of our history are fading away. What is happening to them? What happens to us as a people when we lose our history? This is a real question, a very salient question that we should ask ourselves. Um, I forget what number, I think it's like 80% of the world lives within uh, a few miles of the shoreline. We all live in coastal environments, very close. Um, bigger storms, more storms, rising sea levels, all of these will impact us in very dramatic ways. So I have some archaeological examples. Um, Dr. Perez's archaeological examples from the interior. Um, and at the end, we'll consider what does it mean to lose the tangible bits of our past. Um, so uh, an important place is Rapa Nui. It is one of the most isolated places on the earth. And yet, um, 800 years ago, 900 years ago, people on boats traveled, Polynesians, ancient Polynesians, traveled all the way across the oceans, navigating via stars and the sun, and arrived at this remote place, and immediately began constructing monuments to their ancestors, ringing ringing the island. They created petroglyphs marking the deeds of their ancestors. Um, they buried their dead. All in, these, all in this um, incredibly remote place. And as you can see, many of these, the, sta the, the statues that we know of that we're familiar with, the East, we call them Easter Island heads, but it's actually more than a head. There's a body, and there's, sometimes they have little hats. Um, and so these are the Moai, Moai, and they're on platforms called Ahus. Um, and they're, they're emplaced right along the shoreline, looking out over the ocean. Um, and they are threatened by climate change. Why? Well, storms force erosion of sea cliffs. Sea levels come up. All of these will force these moai, or these ahu, to disappear into the ocean if we do nothing about them. An important point to consider, because the question here is, what does it mean to lose our history? What does it mean to lose our heritage? Um, these mo oh, this is so bright in here, we can't see them. But they're right here. Yeah. And we can, consider, we can consider them, right? We can consider these statues the Easter Island heads. Um, it is a very beautiful picture. Um, the Moai are the ancestors of the Polynesians who settled this island. They aren't representative, they aren't symbolic of the ancestors. They are the ancestors. They are the ancestors deified and made into statues. Um, you know, we, we must cast aside um, Western science and our Western notions of personhood and uh, how we conceive of life and death. Um, the Ahu are the ancestors personified and when they are lost, the ancestors will be lost as well. In addition to, uh, this, is a this is a burial, it's called Ovahi Beach and it's where the ancient Polynesians buried their dead, right up against the shoreline. Um, which will be also lost as sea levels continue to rise. Um, furthermore, there are um, petroglyphs uh, right here. You can see petroglyphs and up there too, which were constructed all along the caldera of this volcanic rim. And they record the deeds of ancestors, including a competitive race. Um, they would swim from one island to the other to go capture bird's eggs. And those deeds of the ancestors are recorded along these petroglyphs. Many of them have had to be relocated 
because increasing storms, stronger storms, and erosion are forcing, um, are causing these um, petroglyphs to disappear. So they must be relocated. And we have to ask ourselves, what happens when we lose the context of these petroglyphs? What happens when we lose where they come from, where they were originally emplaced? Um, we should not forget that the experience of a place is just as significant um, as the objects that were placed there. Um, if we lose the ability to go to this caldera, um, which is incredibly gorgeous, and if we lose the ability to go there and visit um, and see the petroglyphs and experience them and understand them, um, how will we understand um, the history and the deeds of these Polynesians who built this, built all these um, beautiful um, monuments? So there's things to consider. Um, there are other places. Um, and one famous uh, environment are the Orkney Islands north of Scotland. With covered in 3,000 archaeological sites going back to the Neolithic and before. Over half of these little, all of these dots mark the locations of sites, and over half of them are threatened by climate change. Increased erosion, sea level rise, same forces that affect archaeological sites all over the world. What is lost here? Tourism, investment, um, people's economies. One famous site, the site of Scarabray, which we see here, um, which is a World Heritage Site, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, it is sometimes called the Scottish Pompeii. Um, it is a um, Neolithic village with houses that had plumbing, that had toilets. They were incredibly sophisticated. Um, this is located right against the shoreline. Um, we also have um, stone objects with inscriptions on them. All of these uh, important artifacts. Um, some forms of proto-writing on them that we still have yet to um, work out. What does that mean, right? Um, what does it mean if we lose this part of our history? Um, this is just a bird's eye view of Scarabray. And if the video works, um, what we see here is that it's right up against the shoreline. And this bay, as you see right here, this little bay that cuts in right there, that was not a bay at the time that the site was built. So in just 5,000 years, we get the formation of this bay. And how quickly will we then begin to see um, that water come up against the site? And how quickly will we then lose this site? <clears throat> the Orkneys have chambered tombs, Neolithic chambered tombs, Stone Age tombs, where people interred their dead, where they built observatories of the, to the universe. Um, this is what a chambered tomb or a passage tomb looks like. This is Mezo, which is a very famous chambered tomb. Um, it is astronomical, it's alignment, um, the, the way the passage is aligned and the way that there are view holes to the outside, it aligns with um, astronomical alignments. Um, at one point in the past, Vikings revisited this site and carved uh, Viking graffiti on the walls that is uh, unrepeatable in polite company. Um, Vikings. Um, But what happens if, if, what did the Vikings write in this passage tomb that's eroded into the ocean? We don't know. Um, there are sites um, like Scarabray um, that are um, incredibly sophisticated Neolithic villages that are located um, right on the water's edge, in the water, in fact. And that's an archaeologist who's working at, the, at a site like that. And, it will be gone soon. Um, and it's this story of loss that makes me very reflective um, and pensive about heritage because I think our heritage is critical. And if we lose it, we lose a lot. We, that is a question, maybe a rhetorical question. What do we lose? One final site in the Orkneys that I really want to talk about, I just really like a lot, is the Ness of Brodgar 
um, which is this massive um, Neolithic village located on this tiny spit of land. And um, we think it's a, there's a temple complex there, there are houses. Um, in some places, there is a protective wall six meters thick. What were they protecting themselves against? Six meters thick, that's massive. Um, just some things to think about. And where I have applied this work, where I have applied my um, sort of consideration of climate change in archaeology, is in coastal Louisiana, which is a river delta composed entirely of sand, silt, and clay um, that is sinking into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, all of these little yellow triangles mark the locations of monumental Native American sites. And they are all built along various deltaic lobes of the Mississippi River. Um, and they were built at different times um, over a 6,000 year uh, period of time. And the whole river delta itself is eroding. Um, this is a difficult image to see in this light, but red means land loss, purple means land loss. And the only good news is green, and the only place where we see land building is out here in the Atchafalaya and Wax, Life, uh, Wax Lake deltas. These monumental sites are um, villages. There are places where Native Americans buried their dead. There are places where Native Americans um, took land and made it into a sacred place. Um, the Chittimacha and the Homa of coastal Louisiana have stories about um, mythical creatures diving into primordial waters and gathering up sediment to build land. And the building of mounds and the building of these monumental villages is an enactment of those stories, of those myths about their ancestry. Um, this is, a, again, this is a, actually what we see here is a cemetery, but this is a Native American mound that a historic cemetery was constructed on top of. And at one point, this was, there were five of these. Um, it was once part of a larger five mound complex. Um, and today there's only one left. This is located in coastal Louisiana. Um, the advantage of colonists and settlers building their own cemeteries on top of these Native American sites is that they're often preserved. Sort of an inadvertent effect of um, desecrating someone else's burial grounds. Um, but you know, we've done a lot of work, and me and my colleagues have done a lot of work out there studying how the mounds were built, what were they made of, what kind of landforms they were built on. Um, Fascinating thing that we learn is that um, in this type of image, red is higher elevation land, yellow and blue and green are lower elevation land, um, is that many of these earthen uh, mound sites, these monumental villages, um, are coupled with high elevation landforms. Um, and we, we take this to mean that indigenous peoples understood the landscape around them and understood um, higher elevations versus lower elevations, they understood the effects of water and flooding. And um, in this region, many of their monumental sites were built on higher elevation landforms. Furthermore, I've argued that some of these mounds, which is represented in cross section right here, were constructed in very geotechnical fashion. They were built with alternating layers of sediment and then capped with clay in order to keep them together, to keep them cohesive. <clears throat> when they do erode, when they do fall apart, what we see um, is that it happens quite quickly. Um, in some parts of coastal Louisiana, we have mound sites surrounded by marsh out in open water. And this is just the difference of eight years. And again, if this was not so bright, we could see it better. but. Um, this tree is the same as that tree, and all of this was ringed by a marsh, and in just a short period of time, it's completely eroded away. This shows the limits of the mound in 2011, and then in 2016, it's been eaten away already. Um, so we have a fairly rapid timeline for how earthen mounds in coastal Louisiana, how quickly they can erode. We've lost over half this mound in just eight years. Um, 
And that's fairly significant. Like I said, these mounds are places where indigenous peoples made land. They made their own land. They would, by one basket load of earth after another, built a mound to enact or recreate their own stories about um, how the world was made. Um, based on studies that we've done, what we understand is that um, some parts of Louisiana are losing archaeological sites at almost the rate of two per year. That's how quickly Louisiana is losing land. Um, it's not just um, archaeological sites. It's the land that those sites are built on as well. And that's very significant. Um, I don't know how I am on time, but I'm going I'm to pause and allow my colleague to take over, and uh, we'll summarize at the end. Everyone hear me okay? Okay, so now we're going to move in two directions. We're going to move temporally back to the Archaic period, which extends back to about 8,000 years BC. And we're also going to move spatially into Tennessee. So um, Dr. Mehta was talking about coastal sites, and I'm going to talk about interior sites on an interior river. So this area, the Middle Cumberland River Valley, as you can see, is shaded in purple. Um, it's centered, well, Nashville's part of it. It's not really the center of it. Um, here in this picture, this shows the modern Cumberland River where you have a dam here at Old Hickory Dam on the east side of Nashville and Cheatham <coughs> Dam on the west side of Nashville. This is for modern water control, um, for power generation, and for flood control. And as you'll see, as I continue, flooding is a... Uh, is a big issue for this area, or has been a big issue. Um, because of those dams being built and the channelization of the river, so they dug it out so you could have massive barge traffic that can come up and down the river, um, it really changed the diversity of the animals that live in the river, so the fishes and the shellfishes. And um, we know that they've changed a lot since the Archaic period because of our work that we've done there. So in this dotted area that's the Middle Cumberland River Valley, um, there's a lot of water there, right? there are a lot of rivers and streams, and all of these little dots represent an archaeological site. <coughs> so there's over 3,000 known recorded archaeological sites in this river valley, in this particular area, that date from about 12,000 years ago all the way up into the time of European contact with Native Americans. So there's quite a few sites in a very small area. <clears throat> to narrow that down a little bit more, in the Archaic period, there are about 1,300 sites. So almost half of all the known sites date to this time frame of 8,000 to 1,000 BC. Kind of drilling down a little bit more, within that time period, oh yeah, it's hard to see it with this lighting, but you can see the little white diamonds. Those are Archaic period shell-bearing sites. What's a shell-bearing site, you might ask? Well, it is a site that sometimes they're called middens, and most people probably have heard the term midden. It's a trash deposit, right? Ancient trash deposit. Um, here in Florida, we have a lot of shell mounds. These are not mounds. These are definite, um, just kind of broad deposits. The debate on if they're middens or something else is not for today's discussion, but it is ongoing for, it's been going on for decades. Um, so basically, these sites are composed of freshwater shellfish, and typically they're bivalves and gastropods, and in our case, which I'll talk about, they're mostly gastropods. Um, within these sites, you have <coughs> most, if not all of them, have human burials. So they're a really important record of not only kind of subsistence and the environment of the past, but also past human health, demography, um, ritual, possibly religion, religious beliefs, and then also some of the artifacts that get buried with people. So these sites, because they're burial sites, are well known to the collecting, looting, and avocational communities. Very well known. Um, looters go after the burials because they, they want to find artifacts that are included in the burials, similar to what are pictured here. Really finely crafted lithic tools that probably were never meant to be used in any shape. Uh, or form except for as an offering or an inclusion in a burial. They are known for things like these fine bone pins in the middle. Um, the bottom one is a turkey 
tarsometatarsus, which is actually a tattooing implement, and that's a whole other talk um, that I've done research on. And then we have also some of the earliest evidence in some of these areas of early cultigens or indigenous plants. Um, really, I have five minutes. We'll try. We'll try. Um, and then also it can tell us about how people arrange themselves on the landscape. So these sites are really important for a number of reasons um, other than you know, just the people that are buried in them. Now, what does climate have to do with this? Well, over the weekend of May 1st and 2nd in 2010, uh, Middle Tennessee ex experienced an extreme weather event. Uh, it was like the perfect storm of too much water, um, of some pressure systems that kind of blocked this, this rain system from moving, and tornadoes. Um, at that time, this event was called a 100-year flood, and I'll tell you how much water actually fell. Um, now it's something called along the lines of a 1,000-year flood when they went back and realized that it was so drastic. Um, during that weekend, over two days, a total of 14 inches of rain fell within two days. The, um, the water drainage systems could not handle it. Um, there were higher rainfall amounts around Nashville, so all that water had to go somewhere. Where did it go? It came to Nashville, right? It's running down these streams into the Cumberland. Um, the Cumberland River crested just shy of 52 feet, which is like, okay, what does that mean? Well, flood stage for the Cumberland is 40 feet. So at 40 feet, it is flooded. At 52 feet, it is catastrophic. Um, as you can imagine, this was a devastating event. I lived in Middle Tennessee at this time. I experienced it firsthand. Um, 18 people died in Middle Tennessee, more than 25 in the Kentucky, Tennessee area in general that weekend. There was over $2 billion in property and infrastructure damages for modern, the modern infrastructure of modern properties. That's pretty heavy stuff, right? So I'm an archeologist, right? I don't deal with modern things. The effects of this event also took a toll on the cultural resources. And this is the kind of um, impact that is often overlooked by the general public and even um, people that deal with rivers and flood control and in some cases cultural resources. So here we were after the flood and we knew about these shell bearing sites because there's a whole bunch of them. And actually everything I've told you so far about those archaic shell bearing sites was more or less what we knew about them. We knew they existed. They were in the files, but no one had done any real research on them. So there had been reports of looting at some of these sites, which many are located on publicly held properties, either by Metro Nashville or um, by the federal government. There's also some on private land. Um, so we'd heard about these reports. I worked for a university. My colleagues worked for the state archaeologist's office. So we went out to look at them and to see what was going on. And we had two issues. We had some erosion, or a lot of erosion, because of the floods. And we had looting that was taking place as soon as the looters could get out on the river. And I would not say safely get on the river, because those waters stayed pretty high for a long time. It was pretty dangerous. Um, but in this picture, this is one of the state archaeologists. And this site is um, a shell midden site or a shell bearing site. And you can see all of the shell kind of littered down here on the bottom. And basically what happened was the river came down, cut away new exposure to the site. The looters came out. They see this shining white band of shell when they're going down the river in their boats. And they stop, and they start picking at it. And they're looking for burials so they could find the artifacts that are with the people. So this is what we saw here. Another site. Um, there's a lot of erosion that happened here, which I won't go into all the details. I will tell you that this looter pit, um, when I stood in it, came up to here on me. It is a very deep pit, so over three feet deep. We were mad, to say the least. It was kind of sick to my stomach, actually, because I've never seen looted. And there's other sites I'm not even showing you. There are like 12, 15 sites that we looked at. We were pretty upset. What could we do? Um, we applied to the National Science Foundation for something called a rapid response grant. We were the first um, archaeology project to receive one of these. And when I say rapid response, it is meant for these types of events where time is of the essence. Normally, you apply to NSF, and it's, what, a six-month turnaround, maybe an eight-month turnaround, 24 hours. We applied 24 hours later. We had the money. It was that quick. Um, so that enabled us to get out and start surveying sites. We surveyed 123 sites only along the bank lines, so only those that should be exposed in the river bank line. 
because that's what would have been most impacted by the erosion from the flooding and from the, um, the looting. So 123 sites. Um, I can tell you before I move on that there were two sites we never found again, even though we had GPS locations. They completely eroded away. And there was one site that when we sampled it, we took the last of the site as our sample. That was all that was left. And we're talking like eh, maybe like a five gallon bucket of sediments. Okay, so here's another one of those big sites, right? It's a beacon. Like, look at me, I'm over here. Come look at me. This is one of the state archeologists, my good friend and colleague, Aaron Dieter Wolf. And we looked at this site, this was in June after we could get back out there safely. You can see all of the erosion. It has not been looted yet. <laughs> this feature right here, it's actually an earth oven. The looters thought it was a burial and they came and a couple days later, just dug it out and we came back in three weeks, it was gone. Another site, this is a whole, a really fun story I'd love to tell you, but I know that you, Nicole, will not let me. Um, this is someone's patio. This is to give you the kind of effect of the erosion. It eroded away so fast and so furious that their patio is now hanging over just precariously into kind of thin air, right? There's a site underneath it. My colleagues are pointing to human remains. Um, the looters would come and they would dig out the human remains and throw them down the bank line so that they didn't want them, they wanted the artifacts. Um, and we had to deal with that. We, we picked them up and inventoried them and cataloged them and got them on a, a NAGPRA list and whatnot. Um, another image of how bad the flooding was. This is a site, I've shown you a picture of it, what it looked like when it was eroded, but I did a lot of work at. This is on a normal day. Cumberland River, a creek right here, some sports fields, normal day. May 3rd. Yeah, so this is a water uh, sewage treatment plant. Luckily, the water stopped before it got there. Um, the creek, which is what, right here, crested at 26 feet. So it's massive amounts of water. The reason you don't see it down here on this side, which is the um, west side, is because it's a limestone bluff that goes up 40 feet in the air. So that water is just racing down the Cumberland, hitting that wall and spewing that way. Um, and it was, it was devastating to these sites. Another picture of that same site. Whoops, wrong way. Another picture of that same site that we went to in June. And this one was back in the brush line, so not visible from the river. Um, you can see some alternating dark and light bands. When we sampled this, we found out this is actually a, a prehistoric flooding episode. So this is archaic. It floods, people leave, and they come back later in time. It's beautiful. It was a great place to take samples. We came back in a month to check on it. Bam, looted again. It's just over and over and over. Let's see. Um, what we found when we did this assessment of all of these sites was that the looting was um, the worst the further west you went of Nashville. Partly because things east of Nashville are rip-wrapped, so they're blocked off with stone or cement or some other kind of um, material that keeps them from eroding into the river because there's so much construction. Right? There are buildings, there's industry, there are apartment buildings, there are concert venues on the river in Nashville. Um, and the further west you go, the less populated it is. So there's no one there to catch the looters. No one's watching them. And they're really damaging private property and publicly held property. Um, so that was a really big issue for us, which there are laws in place to help deal with that, but you have to catch people and like physically catch them in the act to make it stick, and we never could catch them in the act, um, even though we know who was doing it, because they're pretty brazen. Um, so, because I know I'm running out of time, to put, to like kind of step back and think about, there was a lot of devastation. From an archeological standpoint, it was really rough to know that we didn't know a lot about these sites and now we had a chance to know, like to not know as much as we could. We always thought these sites were protected, they're on, you know, publicly held property, no one's gonna mess with them. And then bam, over a weekend, we saw some major destruction. So, when we formulated our plan to go out and survey these sites, not only for erosion and looting, we had a sampling strategy in mind so that we could sample them the way archaeologists like to sample sites so we could get maximize our data collection without hurting the site any further or drawing looters' attention to it. That was a really important part of it. Um, we were able to get additional funding through a different source to put together the first ever radiocarbon chronology of these sites. So we actually know what they all date to. We know that these, um, this 
shellfish harvesting was going on for about 6,000 years in this part of the Cumberland, which is, predates some of the other interior rivers where they have evidence of um, shellfishing. I'm gonna skip this one because that's that earth oven feature that I showed you before. Um, we know that at our sites in the Middle Cumberland, they are predominantly made up of freshwater gastropods. So these little tiny snails, right? Here, little tiny snails. Millions of them in one site. Other sites that are contemporaneous in Kentucky on the Green River are made up of bivalves and very few gastropods. So this was, we were able to be like, look, these sites, they might date to the same time period. They are not all the same. Bivalves are there, we have them, but not like we have gastropods. And in a paper that I've written, we've talked about them as kind of early snaileries or places where people are managing snail populations, they're snail farming as a sustainable foodway. Okay, so I think we need to wrap up. Right. Come on up. Okay. You go first. Okay. Uh, so, I'll leave you with some rhetorical questions um, about our collective identity, our shared identities. Um, is our collective identity rooted in a shared past? We are Americans, we live in the United States. Um, we have a narrative about um, the founding of our nation. We have a narrative about um, what is important to us. Um, our national mall is located within 10 miles of the Chesapeake Bay. And the Chesapeake Bay has experienced over 30 inches of um, rise in specific places since the 1930s. Um, consider, that, that consider the National Mall. Consider that we have all of these state-funded museums that codify our histories. And consider how those places will be impacted as the Chesapeake and surrounding waters continue to rise. Um, so thinking about our shared history, um, what happens when we lose that shared history? Um, and what is our concept of self? Who are we? How do we think of ourselves? And how is that rooted in, uh, in, an, in a historic past, in an archaeological past? And what it means when we lose those things? Um, this tends to get very nihilistic and dire. Um, and there is actually a, a much more positive approach to take uh, and one that is actionable where we can actually do some good. Uh, and, and Dr. Perez has those, those points. Thanks. Yeah, so actually I just had an article come out last week um, called Putting the Positive in the Negative and what we could learn from this really negative experience and how we could make it positive and how other archaeologists could learn from what we did to um, apply it to their own potential situations. While this flood was, is considered a historic, one-off type thing, we know that as climate changes and the southeast gets hotter, the uh, rainfall changes, the amounts of it and, and uh, the number of days changes, these events are going to continue. I mean, just in the last few weeks, we've seen flooding in Austin and in Pittsburgh and in some other places in the Midwest that they need to deal with the same thing that we dealt with. Middle Tennessee is not special. We're not the only ones that have sites on rivers. Other places do as well. So in writing this article, Aaron and I were like, well, what can we tell other professionals that they could do that would help them? Um, the first was that we had partnerships. We had relationships with other agencies um, and other institutions and organizations before this even began. I, I'm a professor, I worked at a university in Middle Tennessee. My collaborator is a state archeologist for the state. Um, we already had a professional relationship established before this happened, so it made it easy for us to quickly dive in and share resources. We had a good working relationship with the archeologist that's at the Army Corps of Engineers in the Nashville district, so that was very helpful. Um, we had other professional archeologists in academia and the private industry at our disposal to share equipment or people or ideas or their information about these sites. Um, we also had a good relationship with the avocational community. That was really important. And of course with Metro Nashville. So it facilitated us getting permits that we needed because we still had to have federal and, and local permits to dig on these sites and, um, and access to them as well. So that was super important. Um, 
having a plan for sam scientifically sampling the sites. It was more than just checking off boxes on a form and taking pictures, which is what I think a lot of people thought we did at first. We took a lot of samples so that we would have that data knowing that the next flood was going to wipe away more of those sites. Um, because we did systematic scientific sampling, we were able to show these massive trends in the data that our sites are different than other sites of this time period, that they're much older than previously thought, um, and that the shellfish collecting went on for actually a lot longer than most people thought too. And that we need to um, preserve these data digitally for other people to look at. We need to preserve the samples um, so for other types of analyses that can happen in the future with new techniques, since many of these sites are gone or are leaving us. And um, I guess we just need to realize that this is going to continue to happen, and we need to have plans in place for what it does so that we can respond rapidly. That's it. Thanks. <laughs>